Um, okay. Um, obviously, we will have people join a little bit late, but we're a couple of minutes in now. Um, so we'll get going with the meeting for, for time. I know we um, effectively ran out of time last time, so I don't want to waste, waste too much now. Uh, right, if I can get on to the next slide. Um, before we move on to the main topic, just to mention that we're, um, for those of you who are also following the R Adoption Series by the R Consortium, um, we have um, provisionally agreed the title of the next um, one in that series. Um, so Colleen and Ning will be joined by some guests at some unnamed time in the future. So have a look out on the R Consortium website for that. I'll mention it in a, an email update soon um, as well. Um, and if you're interested in that with the topic of around submissions in R, if you have any questions that you would like to ask for um, regulators in general, um, but specifically for the FDA, um, I'd appreciate if you could send me um, those questions. I'll pass on to Clean and Ning uh, for that session. So um, that might tell you something about what we've got planned for the session, but it is a little bit cryptic, I appreciate at this point. Um, but if you have any questions, anything you want to learn about submissions, we'll, we'll, we'll be sharing that in the R Adoption series. And if you've not heard of the R Adoption series, um, you can navigate to the R Consortium um, homepage. Uh, and under webinars, um, from one of the tabs at the top, you can get to webinars and you can find all the historical webinars um, there. Uh, and this, this one will be advertised there in due course. Okay, so for today, to get quickly onto that, um, this is part two of at least a three part series now. Um, we've had um, an unprecedented amount of um, interest in people coming forward to share case studies of how they're implementing either the directly the thinking of the R validation hub, or as if you caught part one, you'd have seen slight variations on what we're um, uh, what we propose. Um, so if you missed part one, there's a link uh, here that I will send out um, again after afterwards. As a reminder, you can go on there now and watch the video. And um, we're part partway through a website update for the R Validation Hub. Um, uh, so that will be updated on the website soon as well. So you'll be able to link directly from, from that and go and watch the video of that and the video of this, should you have to leave, leave early or anything like that. Um, so from there, um, I won't do too much in terms of recap. We had four presentations last time um, and we've got two more this time. Um, and that should give us um, a good 30 minutes or so to launch into a sort of general Q&A slash panel discussion. So we've got, um, I think, almost all, all or almost all of the presenters from last time here as well. So if you've got questions on um, the talks last time or the two talks a day or just general questions of people who are implementing um, implementing um, GXP, R for GXP kind of approaches within their companies, then um, uh, we've got a good 30 minutes or so to make sure that we discuss that today. Okay, unless there's any immediate questions coming up, I will hand over to, hopefully, to, to Damien. I didn't do a check if, oh, there you are. Uh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Excellent, so I'll stop sharing. Um, and Damien, hopefully you've got the rights to share. Let me check. Can you see my screen? Yes. We can. And it is now in slideshow. We're seeing that fine. That's great. Perfect. So welcome, everyone. And uh, really uh, happy about the last session that we had. Uh, we saw four really good examples of how R is used in the GXP environments, especially our validation hub approach on the processes. Um, so today I would like to spend the 10 minutes that I have uh, on talking not only about the validation itself, but also on the broader context, because I saw that in the questions you asked a lot about what happens next and uh, some additional questions. Uh, we have a lot of experience in working in GXP environments, so I would like to give you a peel of uh, experience that uh, we currently have and would be happy to discuss this further during the uh, discussion session. So after a short introduction, I will go through the three steps, which are the accuracy, reproducibility, and traceability. Um, the introduction, my name is Damian Rodjevic. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm the president of Absilon and one of the founders. Um, Absilon is a company that provides uh, Shiny consulting. So we work with, other, uh, with our clients, uh, helping them build uh, Shiny dashboards on top of the uh, R models that uh, they have developed although we also work very often in R directly. Um, and we had a, a chance to work, uh, and we are currently working with uh, many different Fortune 500 companies uh, in restricted environments. 
uh, especially in uh, Fortune 100 uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies, where we actually got to see different approaches that are used uh, to using R in uh, GXP. So let's take a look uh, quickly on the GXP itself, uh, which is here for ensuring a safe and reliable product. Um, for accuracy, we have the validated packages part, the process and uh, the distribution of the packages. Then there is the whole SDLC process, uh, how to actually um, allow using those results and uh, using the application uh, to uh, actually uh, move forward. Um, then uh, there is uh, programming practices uh, that you should apply and uh, from the reproducibility, how you can actually make sure that you can reconstruct the full environment used to, produ uh, to produce the results. Um, the last part that I'm going to share is traceability. So how to reconstruct the development history of a drug or medical uh, device and how to uh, have this accountability. So the ability to resolve who actually has contributed what and when. Um, let's start with the accuracy. Um, when it comes to validated packages uh, and the process, uh, we uh, focused a lot on the uh, testing and approval part. And uh, as you have seen already in the past uh, presentations, uh, this process is uh, quite similar. Uh, you need to, to set the right rules that you abide by and you agree with the IT team on that one. Um, you need to test the meta information. You need to test the source code. And sometimes you actually need to write the test yourselves uh, if you really need to use a functionality that isn't well tested. The next step is the distribution and infrastructure. You need to ensure that the data scientists have the right uh, access uh, to the packages and updating and adjusting, how to track versions, update the repository and uh, how to write new tests. Um, shortly about testing and approval, uh, I highly recommend you to uh, keep using the risk metric package uh, the, and the assessment application. Uh, these are great uh, open source solutions that are uh, developed by our validation hub and uh, they already provide you all of the meta information that is needed uh, to actually make uh, your assessment. And of course, you can uh, enhance it further and uh, contribute back. Uh, so this is a really, really um, a great uh, solution to have. Uh, when it comes to distribution infrastructure, I have seen many different ways of actually uh, deploying the packages uh, to the data scientists. What I wanted to share with you um, is the one that I like the most. So there are different approaches, uh, providing Docker image that is available to the users uh, there could be uh, an ability to uh, have a full image uh, within AWS, for example, that reconstructs uh, the whole uh, machine. Uh, I like the lean approach of using RStudio Package Manager that allows you to have your own copy of CRAN. Uh, however, within your internal infrastructure, that can be actually also used uh, offline. So once you do the validation on anything that comes from CRAN, GitHub internal, you can install this directly in Package Manager and you can set up spaces there uh, so that uh, anything that you validate is directly accessible by data scientists in the development environment, but also in the production environments. If you want to use Docker, you can do it as well because you just pull those packages, not from CRAN, but from your internal URL that is provided. Um, and this is great because there is no chance for a sleep. Uh, your data scientists uh, do not even have access to CRAN, uh, but they actually pull everything directly from package manager. So what happens if you want to update or adjust your packages? Um, you saw in the Roche presentation, and you have, uh, haven't seen the presentations uh, last time, uh, definitely please go through all of them, um, to automate as much as possible in the process. Uh, this is going to uh, take a lot of uh, waves from, uh, from your back and uh, will allow you to, out to quickly check uh, and validate a new package. Uh, once this is validated, uh, you can push it directly to our studio package manager so that this is uh, automatically available to your users. Um, and here you can actually organize those packages into different uh, groups that are called sources. So CRAN, for example, is one source of packages. Uh, there could be a local source or internal. You can have pre-compiled packages there as well. And then you can also group the sources into repositories. Uh, so for example, you can give URL to your users for the production repository, and it co could contain a subset of CRAN, uh, some additional local packages, but you have full control over what the users are using um, in, your, uh, in your environments. So one question that, that I often get is what happens when the package is very big uh, or doesn't pass the validation and you really want to use the functionality. Uh, so first of all, uh, there was an, one of the answers uh, that you just asked the requester to add unit tests and to merge them back into the package. And this is a good solution, especially if uh, the functionality is small and you can uh, write those tests within a couple of hours. Um, however, one of the uh, 
interesting things that you can do uh, if you have a big package to use. You can actually create an, another package that uh, subsets the functionalities from the big one. So imagine you have a deep layer and you want, just want to use the first function. Um, you could create a new package that uh, exposes only this first function and you can write tests to this. And of course, all of the dependencies that uh, are used by this uh, particular functionality. So let's jump into the SDLC process and, uh, and the IQ, OQ, and PQ. Uh, these are reflected by three main areas, the documentation, installation, and testing. And this is very important because once you set it up right, uh, you wouldn't have problem with deploying your application uh, within the GXP uh, environment. Otherwise, the process can be very lengthy and can involve a lot of people. So for the documentation, of course, Writing this from scratch is problematic and it takes time. It is important to start uh, just as you're, uh, or even of course, uh, before uh, you start even uh, doing any implementation. But uh, the important part to keep in mind is that you can generate parts uh, uh, of the documentation directly from the code and readme. Uh, so if during your development process, you uh, learn to document all of the functionalities to write a good uh, readme, uh, this is going to benefit you a lot uh, during the uh, SDLC process. Uh, once you are actually going to production. For installation, I propose to use the infrastructure as a code approach where everything that uh, you install as a, a library or any dependency uh, is fully coded. Of course, uh, we know RNF, we, we know Packrat, and we know Docker, but uh, if you don't uh, use Docker within your organization, you can actually use Terraform and Natsible that I'm going to show you uh, in a couple of uh, seconds. Uh, then when it comes to testing, the more you focus on building unit tests in your application that you later want to promote to so GXP, um, the easier it's going to be uh, within the process because then you just export your unit test and this already shows that your application is tested and you can even list the pull request. So please make sure that you do the code review within your company and then you can just list the pull request that uh, you have done. And this already confirms that uh, there was a set additional set of eyes that have looked through any code that has been implemented. And also for more complex processes, you can even automate end-to-end -end tests. I have been in projects where it takes uh, weeks to actually go through the whole process of testing, which is done by a completely separate test team that follows the uh, screenshots and scenarios that are described for this particular application. So also updated, updating this is problematic because you change small, one small functionality and then you have to change all of the documentation. Um, you then have to process this to the test team and they have to go through the whole set of uh, scenarios after any change of the code. If you have this automated, this can be done in a very, very fast way. So what are the programming practices that you should employ from the day one? Uh, you should set the coding styles, uh, coding and styling standards uh, in your organization from uh, the very beginning. Uh, create a definition of them. What does it mean that you actually merge the code into the main branch? Uh, definitely use Git or any other source uh, version control. Uh, this is a must. Uh, and you should document all of the low level rules, uh, even the simple ones like date format, which is important uh, that it is not uh, an an ambiguous, sorry. Um, you need to make sure that your code is uh, well documented and testable. Uh, so extract the functions, avoid code duplication, write the unit tests and to document everything. I have seen projects where the amount of code actually grows uh, into one huge uh, uh, pile of uh, uh, lines without any additional functions. And this is problematic once you actually want to go to production, we've already a great solution that uh, provides a lot of value. Now, you can set up uh, continuous integration pipelines, uh, use linter and run tests automatically. And this will allow you to very quickly iterate on your application or any solution that you're building with R. Uh, for shiny applications, there are some end-to-end -end solutions that allow you to go through a scenario and automatically make a screenshot of the state of the solution and compare the screenshots to the screenshots that you are uh, expecting to see. And this can be a tremendous help uh, in the testing process. OK, uh, quickly going into edge reproducibility and uh, taking a look at the time. Um, if you cannot use Docker in your organization, Terraform will automate setting up servers. Uh, so it can set up uh, many servers uh, with a given specification that you provide and even firewalls. And then Ansible will automate installing all of the libraries that you have. Um, Important thing to know is that if you use Docker and you want to use RStudio Connect, for example, uh, RStudio will enable running Dockerized applications uh, soon. So this is very good news, uh, especially that I know that this uh, is very important for many IT teams to uh, make sure that uh, 
we comply with uh, other standards that uh, are in the organization. Um, so very quickly going through the last part, the traceability, um, the Git itself is actually providing you a very good history of how your solution has been implemented. But you should uh, keep in mind that you should be logging a lot of information directly from your application or your uh, R Markdown uh, uh, file or any other R solution. Uh, there is a way to set up a format and there are really good uh, packages that you can just use uh, to uh, provide logs. And you need to set up a separate infrastructure to collect them and uh, to ensure that they are stored. Uh, you need to remember to include all of the meta information in any report or application that is generated. So date, author, sources, system version, environment, uh, and many others. Um, and also one important thing to remember is that whenever you are building our markdown reports in a, a Word document version, you should render and store a, store a PDF version of it as well, uh, so that uh, you can retain it uh, for, uh, for the historic purposes. Okay, so hopefully this was uh, useful to you and uh, hopefully I managed to do it in time. Uh, thank you very much and would be happy to uh, discuss uh, it more through the questions. Thank you, Damien. Um, what we're going to do is put, put questions to the end um, just to make sure we, we get to the point where we can open up the open up the floor. So if you do have questions specifically for Damien, please do um, ask them uh, at the end when we open it up. Otherwise, for now, I will hand over to uh, Nicholas and Satish. I Thanks. Who's Thanks. Worth you sharing? Thanks, Andy. I'll share. This is Nick. And there has been a slight adjustment. So Satish is not joining us. Uh, we do have Jessica Higgins and Eli Miller with us um, to cover that. So, and can you see my screen okay? Yep. All, All right. Good. Perfect. Okay, so uh, thanks for having us. Uh, wonderful presentations. I'm very happy to uh, have the opportunity and to attend all of them. And I'll reiterate, if you missed the previous session, highly recommend going back and checking that out as well as the questions uh, listed as issues. So uh, experience building a GXP framework within R. Uh, so this is J&J &J specifically within our, within our uh, statistical decision science and clinical and statistical programming group. So, we took this very uh, literally. Uh, the question is, you know, how have we been implementing the white paper and what, what are the challenges? Uh, so this was kind of intended to set the stage. We all know why we're here. Um, who's covering what? So myself will cover package validation section. And this is section four in the paper. Section five is system qualifications, which Eli, Eli will cover. Uh, Jessica covering risk assessment framework. I'll touch a bit on some of, some of the challenges. Um, we did put together a panel to try to be able to address any question we thought we would expect, uh, but with Satish not being able to join and Sean not being able to join as well, um, some of those we might log as, as the issues or will be logged as issues, and we'll follow back up and, and get answers to those. Okay, so hopping right into mine. So section four hits a lot on our package validation and uh, similar to, to Damien's workflow that we just had. It's really about accuracy, reproducibility, and traceability. Uh, the key part around accuracy, I mean, the paper touches on base and recommended, uh, contributed packages, popular packages, splitting those into sort of different risk buckets um, and going essentially different workflows applied based off of the bucket a package falls in. We completely align with this. Um, there's really not much to add based off of the other discussions that, that have been done here. Um, so between the risk metrics and whether or not you take a, an automated approach to defining uh, the risk of a package and its acceptability for use versus a more um, expert opinion that requires uh, much more time and review, that I guess we'll touch on a bit later. Uh, but uh, accuracy, yeah, we've got three or four buckets. Uh, we pretty much accept um, base R and recommended without much additional testing. Uh, the popular packages along with uh, the tidyverse and our studio documentation kind of reduces a level of risk and then we've got uh, a separate risk assessment that occurs uh, for basically everything else on the reproducibility front um, we are using uh, rm we are using docker um, the r studio package manager actually the the, the slide that damien showed is essentially our, our setup um, 
And then we use an internal package for called EMV setup to keep consistencies between like interactive execution versus like a, a containerized batch execution. So we have development happening interactively in our studio. Um, our validated container is separate from that. Um, and then code would be executed just on that validated container. And we want to make sure that interactive development area matches the back to execution area, which is locked down um, and immutable. Um, so ENV setup covers that aspect of it. Um, and then Timber is, is one I just tacked on here right before actually the presentation. It, it, it covers the reproducibility aspect from the logging of systems, uh, packages and functions used, errors, warnings, and all of that. But it actually is a nice tie-in to traceability. Um, I dumped in this one paragraph directly from the paper because uh, I thought it was, it was interesting. And, and Timber, I think, actually covers this. So, um, you know, we validate packages or maybe even we validate specific functions within a package, but you get all of those imports with it. So having that risk of being able to trace, well, what, what can you use versus what you cannot use, uh, being able to provide that back and log what you've done uh, for users to understand what they can and can't use, but also understand if they're using something they can't use, what's the process that they should be following now um, if they'd like to use that moving forward. So Timber has added this functionality there. So uh, I'm sure there's, there, I know there's other logging packages out there as well, but I think uh, in terms of the package hitting these few highlighted sentences, um, it does a great job handling that traceability aspect. Okay, um, with that, I'll pass it over to Eli to speak to our system qualification. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, so per the uh, white paper, uh, the primary goal of system qualification is to more or less prove that the R environment is working as expected and doing what we intend it to do. So that's the primary goal of the system qualification. Uh, our secondary goal was to build the qualification process into the existing pipeline uh, to kind of close that loop and require uh, as little intervention as possible uh, in terms of you know, human review or anything like that. Um, so we decided to leverage virtualization and the fact that you know container images are immutable and they're not going to change. Um, so once you validate that uh, image, any container that is uh, being spun up from that, you know you can uh, you can kind of assume that container is validated there. Um, it also leverages our existing uh, pipelines for constructing these environments, um, and so we don't really new, need any new. Uh, compute infrastructure to create the environments. It just gets run through the regular pipeline um, with some additional scripts. So the idea of how we use it was we leveraged ValTools, which was a package that was developed through the Fuse organization. Uh, and the, uh, the idea there was we made one unified process of designing requirements, uh, tests, uh, and test code into one documentation framework. So really you say validate the container and it will or validate the image rather, and it will run all of the uh, tests and output a validation report that is then stored uh, in the container itself. Uh, each package that is intended for use, uh, intended for use and the R environment can get tested with just basic usage. Uh, so one of the things that we did was we installed the package tests uh, into the environment. So let's say you have dplyr, uh, some of the tests that we would run would be test all of the uh, native dplyr tests just to make sure that they, um, you know, they return what dplyr expects them to return. Uh, we also test to make sure packages can load cleanly and unload cleanly. Uh, however, for statistical packages, uh, we verify the results independently. So we have reviewed literature that we have converted into uh, R code. So we will actually start testing the statistical results that the packages are outputting to make sure um, we're getting valid results. Um, and the sum of all of these processes is a validation report that you know gets embedded straight into the image. Uh, the report can then be reviewed by stakeholders. Uh, any issues with the validation, uh, changes need to the environment, anything like that, if we're adding a new package, um, it's a pretty quick process to just add the requirements um, you know, add the tests for it uh, and then send it through the pipeline and have it reviewed um, and then actually be getting used by 
uh, you know, end users, or at least tested by end users, um, you know, a lot quicker than if it was going through a manual QA uh, development and release cycle. Uh, and that is all I had for that. All right, and I'll pass it to Jessica to cover our risk assessment framework. Jessica, are you with us? Might be on mute. You're, you're on mute, I think, Jessica, are you double muted? We can see you and we can see you you're talking, but we can't hear you. No, sorry. Give it, looks like Jessica might have a solution. If not. Yeah, if, if not, I can, I can hop in, but you able to... yeah. I think we might have to go with you, Nick. Sorry, so just, right. I'm just yeah. if you can cut you, yeah, maybe if you can, if, if you can find a way around it, then you can help summarize when we get into the question, the Q and A at the end. Sounds good. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do my best and just go, if you can, if you can hear me, try not to cringe too hard if I completely botched some of this. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, section, section 6162. So purpose and intent, um, intent is really what I we wanted to focus. Hey, there she is. Hey, sorry, I called in okay. on my phone. I'm unsure why my computer is not working. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for everyone for being patient. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to sort of jump in um, right when Nick was talking about the um, one of the interesting parts about risk, the risk assessment was um, running through all this framework, defining uh, to us it was very important to define the purpose and intended use of the package. Um, it and we're coming from a case where we want to be deliberate about what is being included in this validated environment and that this is something that we're going to, that is going to be used. And um, so that, we're Senegalese, sure Senegalese. We're, that we're um, using the right, um, the, the right package for the right job. So understanding the use case is definitely something that we focus on a lot, spend a lot of time talking to the statisticians, figuring out which package do you need? Why do you need it? What are you going to use this for? Um, and then once we had, you know, setting that up was the very first step of what is we going to include. Um, when we, um, next we're trying to determine the risk um, as, you know, this is a difficult, um, I think a difficult part of the risk assessment is just where does everything fall in this level? We definitely utilized risk metric as a tool um, and I spent specifically to gather all of the needed metrics, sort of how often is this, what are the number of downloads, um, where does it include documentation, what does that look like? Um, and one of the things is that, that risk metric is a great tool to assist, um, but it doesn't hit on the quality of the documentation. So that part really still needs um, sort of human eyes and a human assessment. Um, and as we are, um, you know, then we determine the risk and make, uh, make an assessment um, and that sort of we create the, the requirements and the testing required based on the level uh, of risk. But um, I wanted to follow up in talking about responding to the risk. Um, we, we sort of attack this in two different ways. What risk can we be, can be mitigated by testing of this package? By testing the functions to make sure that they're responding to to what we to what and doing what we expect them to do, um, and then additionally, what risk can be mitigated by the RQC QA process um, itself? So relying on that as well to to know that okay, this package um, this function does what it says it does, but if you still if you give an, an incorrect input and it, it's going to give you an incorrect um, output but that's, you still need to rely on your QCQA process. So our testing really revolved around um, making sure that it operated um, how it could. And we also mentioned and documented what the mitigation efforts would be for these types of um, packages. And um, 
uh, talking a little bit about trusted resources, we really did agree that, that whitelisted packages can be added with minimal testing um, and including the documentation uh, that, that comes with those packages and, and comes with the sort of um, the base R documentation and as well as some of the documentation from our studio about the Tidyverse and the um, RLib um, suite of packages. So, um, yeah, from there. All right. And then I know we're got just kind of over a bit, so I'll try to wrap up the challenges quickly. Um, thank you, Jessica and Andy. So the challenges are, are the agility and scope. Uh, GSK, and I, I believe Ellis might have presented the slide that had the two arrows uh, with speed and automation on one side, uh, slowness and experts on the other. Uh, this is, this is a, a huge challenge for us. I'd say we lean uh, not completely on the expert side. We have some automations in place, but um, that review we're really putting on the expert. So the process is slower than uh, most would probably hope, but uh, it, it gives that extra level of confidence as this is something new. So we hope to slide down that uh, that arrow closer to, to automation as we learn and progress here. Uh, another huge challenge, education, enforcement, and change management. So that intended use of a package versus dependency, having everyone with the skill sets and understanding what this means, why they can use something and not another thing. Um, answering the question, if I need this package, why does it take so long to, to get it? So these are, uh, are mostly our, our biggest challenges really are just uh, change management, people understanding why it takes as much effort as it does. Um, actually doing the testing, so probably everyone has uh, this issue or maybe not, uh, data and finding the right published results to use for your testing. And uh, one interesting thing we found, which is kind of specific um, to our implementation with, with Val tools and PDF rendering in our containers is the rendering took longer than anything else. Um, so if it's a route you're looking to go and you might have some policies or something around container builds, uh, maybe early in the process talking to QA to find out if HTML is acceptable during the build process, um, and then you convert it to PDF after as far as having that actual document that you might actually then put signatures and things on. Uh, so the HTML sped up the process considerably and also made it a little bit easier for us to then compare um, expected reports versus um, uh, like what's already been a validated report across our dev and QA prod environments to make sure, in fact, we can confirm everything is operating the same. Okay, so that's it. I will pass it back to you, Andy. Thank you very much. So uh, at this point, we're going to go to kind of an open um, forum for for questions. Possibly the easiest thing is to kind of type the questions into the chat, maybe. Um, well, we'll see. Try try calling them out. If uh, everybody wants to kind of ask a question, um, we can we can go to the chat and try and manage it that way. Um, but I will kick things off and use my um, privilege as host to, to ask one of the questions, which has been already captured in the um, in GitHub. So uh, the, there will be a reminder. There was a reminder, I think, last time. I'll send a reminder again about the um, questions. Oh, Julian has already done it. You've read my mind. Thank you. Um, so there's some questions from last time that are in um, the issues within GitHub where some of these case studies are now being written up. Um, and one of the questions I like related to something you said at the end, Nick, um, around experts, and you referred to Ellis's diagram with the, um, you know, the automation versus using experts time. How does everyone determine what qualifies an expert? Like who's, who's doing that um, in, in each of your companies? And how do you determine whether someone is sufficiently an expert or not, and do you record that? Do you write down these are the skills someone must have from a, an audit perspective? Well, that's open to all that. The question I think in GitHub was, uh, was for Ellis and the team at GSK, but definitely applicable to you, Nick, and, and probably most, if not all of the um, presenters. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, um, I'll follow back up on the issues with with some colleagues feedback as well, because really Sean Lee is probably better suited to answer this question. So within the SDS, our statistical organization, he did a survey across all of our therapeutic areas of who knew what, what are, what are the common uh, methods that they're using within each TA, and then use that to then identify within each group 
who has that expertise, who's been using those packages for years from, from a stats perspective, validating things that we've been delivering in SaaS forever because we never have to do anything with the QC results. So they've just, that, that's just something they've been doing for decades already using those packages. Um, so we felt pretty confident uh, with, with who we had there um, and that vetting process. But we are going to run into packages where we don't know, like, you know, someone's going to make a request and no one in the group, we have like a core team that we've decided is, are making those decisions. We might see the package request and we're, we're here vetting that package and throw our hands up in the air and say, we're not qualified to do this. And I'd probably start back with the requester themselves and see what they know about the package, why they're requesting it, what's their experience. Um, but that's still, there's still some gray areas for us there. Yeah. Well, you touched on the end is similar to what we're doing at GSK. So I'll, I'll let Becca come in on that. But um, Pritham, I saw you yeah. know a little bit. Did you want to? <laughs> no, yeah. So Andy, I mean, at, at, at Mark, actually, uh, what we do have is uh, we have constituted a panel of one uh, programmer and one statistician who's available at all times uh, to actually review a package and um, get feedback on um, the qualification. Again, at Mark, the, the qualification is based on the deliverables that are being used uh, uh, by that package, uh, so if that is a um, you know publication related or an external agency report, uh, reported um, deliverable, then that actually goes into a lower and a moderate risk. When the package um, goes through that threshold, then the review panel is automatically activated, and we actually go through the testing case scenarios. And so, if it's um, the the big issue right now, at least at Merck, is uh, defining, um, you know, what uh, level of, uh, you know, uh, review should be done, uh, especially for packages that are statistics oriented, mostly inferential statistics oriented. So um, that's where um, we, are, we are thinking of actually implementing an additional review in form of a statistician who's well versed with the, you know, the different a and processes, the analysis and reporting process. That's more of the, um, you know, the focus that Mark is actually looking at right now. So we, we do have a panel of both a statistician and a programming um, uh, programmer that actually looks at the different packages in order to qualify them as well. Thank you. Um, did it, Becca, or did anyone else want to come in with anything different or added to that? I mean, I can, I, I agree with everything. Um, you know, some of the points mentioned about it's, it's going to be a little bit of figuring out as we go, I think, as we encounter new and more complicated use cases. But I think this is particularly relevant for the statistical applications, right? Um, and so we envision a process where it is a partnership with the requester. Um, ideally, that is a person who has experience and knows what they will be using it for, knows what the, you know, the, the functions that are going to be most frequently used from it so that our assessment can be more targeted and we know, you know, which tests to look at. And hopefully they have, the requester has the subject matter expertise that they can better evaluate the, the tests. Thank you. Um, and that leads us on to another question I had, but I'm not going to hog the floor. Does anyone else want to jump in with a question for any of the presenters? Uh, hey, this is Jeremy from Gilead. I'm, I'm wondering how people staff this in general, if it's like a community of expertise and people do this in addition to their day jobs or if it's outsourced or if people have dedicated FTEs just for maintaining our packages. I, I, I know it's kind of a combination, but I'm curious if the presenters could kind of weigh in and talk a little bit about that. So I can start, at least at Mark, we started off um, using um, a dedicated FTEs uh, by starting a working group. And then now it's staffed by dedicated FTEs as well as, um, um, you know, other um, uh, colleagues that were doing it at um, their own uh, time outside of their responsibilities. So it's, it's a combination of both, but we do have a dedicated um, group that is um, actually use, uh, using different processes to uh, do the package qualification as well as uh, uh, system qualifications. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll hop in next. So 
all of the above actually so yeah um we've got a few minimal dedicated most of most of the headcount comes from you know i'll get you get 20 percent of someone's time or maybe 25 percent of someone's time and they they continue to do their portfolio work um and it's a mix of of internal and and vendor support just depending on the skill set needed for for the task really and finding the right fit uh and, and skill set, it can be difficult. So, and just speaking to GSK, we have within Andy's team the dedicated resources for this, you know, focusing on the packages. Um, and, you know, we're, we're thinking about how do you scale up and how can you decrease the burden? I think those are all really important questions. Um, and, and thinking about when you have people come in and request new packages, how you can, you know, get them to, as I said before, a partnership. So, so figuring out how this process is scalable is, is, is something we're actively working on. But at this point, you know, it's starting with the, the smaller group, putting our heads together and um, tackling the, the early use cases. I don't know, Andy, if you have anything to add on, on no, that one. No, <laughs> I, I think the general, the general answer I'm hearing from everyone is pretty similar in that there is, Either a, either a small team or individuals with a small amount of time who are able to kind of focus on this for now, but scalability is kind of acknowledged as a problem where we're going to have to get people from the, the wider business. I hope there was a question similar to this as well um, in the in the written chat, and I, I hope that we're able to come together as a community before long to start sharing examples of tests that we write, of assessments that we write, and so on. Um, I appreciate, I think at the moment, there's, there's probably a bit of reluctance to share, here are the, here's our assessments, because you're making a, a quality assessment of a, of a package, but there may be other, there may be things that we can do in the future. And um, once it, you know, it's one of those things, once it starts, um, it, it will be easier for other people to kind of come in and, and, and chip in. And so hopefully as a community, we can get to a point where we reduce the burden overall and sort of crowdsource that way. Um, other other questions coming in again i've got i've got loads and there's a few that are in, in the github pages but um, i want to make sure that those who have questions here have got a chance to ask them there's one from Stephen i can see in the chat which i'll read out unless anyone has anything else that you want to chip in quickly so the one from Stephen in the chat is who collates the test cases compiled from literature so I guess generally um, we could broaden that slightly as to how how are those test cases um, compiled from literature? Where are people finding them, and how is that how is that done? For those that are doing that, I don't think not everybody was grabbing test cases from literature. I I can jump in. Um, this is a big challenge. Um, I think the idea of you you know it's easy to say here here are the things we want to use with this package now go forth, test, test that it does what it does. Um, so finding the, the, the correct data to use and the, the, the published literature or it comes from you know, a textbook or something like that is, is more challenging. Um, and then also the, you know, sometimes the person coming up with those test cases and going on that literature hunt is, is not the person that who's then writing those those tests in, in R. Um, I think that you, you need to have someone with an understanding of um, the, in the statistical package case of the statistics being done to make sure that they're hitting all of, um, all of what's important. Um, and um, what we found is that it's, it's a bit of a back and forth of, you know, right, talking with um, this, the sort of the stakeholders, the statisticians of, okay, we have this requirement is this that you know this is does this test work this is what we're going to test and then sort of but we've had a bit of a back and forth on um coming up with how, what that looks like right now um hopefully that'll be more streamlined as things go forward and we all work together more on this but um it's definitely i think this is one of the the bigger challenges is um getting this information together and then actually um, make sure that that's sufficient and and that you could find the data that you needed for that kind of testing Any other thoughts on that question? 
I mean, <clears throat> it's in a tangent, but um, some of the test cases that we do um, use for the testing and the package ball equation is um, that we pull directly from the package themselves, especially if they're, um, you know, the authors have included them and then try to run them ourselves in our environment just to make sure that, um, you know, the testing cases are, um, the testing scores are actually correct and um, we're getting the correct <clears throat> scores as, um, you know, indicated by the author of the package. So that's a kind of validation that we also do, but this is something that we're starting to look at at Merck because of, um, you know, quality issues that were raised by the QA teams um, that um, said that we would have to actually look at um, testing more closely, especially for packages that we deem as low risk. And so that's something that um, we're trying to get together and then um, see if we can do that. And on a related note though, but I just wanted to ask all the presenters, if there is any standardized dead test data that you're actually using um, to do all of the testing, or is it something that is, you know, all over the place based on the package? So I think, I think for very basic things, everyone's on board with using the XPT files from the, the CDIS pilot. It's, it seems to show up in all the presentations, but then it's much more difficult once you get down using the, the, the other stat methods. So uh, for that, I don't know of any standard data out there. Um, so that's really the, the challenge. Yeah, that's something that we're trying to figure out as well. And <clears throat> kind of running into roadblocks there. And, and one thing to note there is also if you use internal data, even if it's like uh, gone through data transparency, anonymization, and that to allow you to use it for other purposes, then you can't share anything about it. So it's like, you're doing the work, it's probably less effort, but then you're not gonna be able to share it. And then you're kind of losing, creating potentially this community that I think some people are chatting about potentially having to do where you can share your data in test cases and people can build up on that uh, rather than everyone reinventing that. So. Yeah, this is Jeremy. I've, I've got an internal package that I wanna open source and by far the biggest hurdle is getting our de-identified test data approved for open, for open source. So I either have to decouple everything from the test data, which is a pain, or go through like an additional bunch of review. Like everybody's okay open sourcing the code, but the data is much yeah. better. If you, if you figure that out, I would love to hear how, how you made that happen. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> yep. But one thing I'll add actually is, um, a little while ago, when we first started exploring this internally, we um, we wrote some tests based on publicly available data that supported published um, uh, published books. And often, like when people write these, particularly statistical books, they will separately share their data. Um, normally, there are some conditions around that data, but um, uh, with a view of sharing that publicly, I contacted the authors of one of the books we were using like a couple of years back even now, maybe 18 months ago. And they they were certainly willing, um, I guess, as references for their, their book to say yeah. for us to use the, the test and share the test and that. So, you know, one thing might be useful for us to do as a community is pull together different literature resources that we're using books, papers, and so on, where there are where there is supporting data that we can use and, and make that list available. Maybe that's a page for the our validation hub um, website that we can we can put up. Um, so yeah, if you if you are speaking um, to book um, book authors, paper authors, and you you have lists of data that you're you've been allowed to share, um, yeah, please share with me and Julianne and afterwards, and we can think about how we best surface that information for everybody because that will certainly that will certainly help as a first step until hopefully we were able to start sharing some tests at some point in the future. Okay. Another thing that Joe was bringing up is if anyone is using simulated data that could be shared as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, any data, any data that we can share publicly um, for whatever purpose, tests obviously is the ultimate goal, but yeah, all of that would be helpful. And, and on that note, one of the things we wanted to ask today um, from an R Validation Hub perspective was, um, are there are there any issues that um, you've faced that um, that would not, um, or basically what were the biggest challenges that would be best to solve through our validation hub collaborations? 
so th things that we haven't you know people we've mentioned risk metric and risk assessments and so on that we, we we put out there and the white paper itself is obviously providing guidance what other things are there out there that you think are big issues that we still need to solve um i can go first i mean that's something that's already in the chat and the Is it just me that's lost pre No, well, it's also free on my side. Okay. There was something in the chat. Uh, I'm trying to flick back quickly to the chat to see if I can work out what it was Pritam was referring to in the, in the chat. Does anyone else want to jump in whilst we wait? Kid, oh, Pritam, can we can, you, yeah, can we you can hear me? Again. Yeah, I just stopped my video. Maybe there's uh, some issues with the bandwidth. So, um, you know, just a you know, quick, um, you know, um, the question with respect to what Damien has been uh, referring in the chat is a common repository for you know validated packages or at least qualified packages that we want to take a look at. I think that would be a very good um, step forward as well because uh, that's something a lot of organizations I think are also struggling with is um, defining that and um, you know if we can get some sort of a validation from the different organizations that. You know, some of these packages have been used for submissions and there's okay, or, you know, we got a go ahead from regulatory as well. So that I think that that would be a good uh, exploration point as well. I don't know how others feel about this. <clears throat> uh, I, I agree. I think it'd be fantastic. Uh, there's, of course, challenges, but what doesn't have those challenges? Um, and as Andy kind of touched on, if there's just a way to get it started, um, then I would think it would pick up steam. I do want to make one comment, though. Uh, we we don't validate our packages. We're validating our entire environment, and those packages reside within that environment. So that might act, that that is also another challenge. It's like, what does it mean when we say that that's validated, and we don't want then people to go and well. J and J said it's validated. I'm going to use it for whatever. Um, when for us, it's really the process of executing all of those tests in the environment that return an expected uh, document with everything passing. That's really when we're saying you can now use dplyr, but not before that. Yeah, I, I've we've talked a lot about this as a um, as a steering kind of committee for for the R validation hub as the, as the exec and it's difficult because no one really wants to say, yeah, we approve this and put that stamp of approval on in the public domain. But you can do other things like, for example, if you write tests for a particular package or like, like I was mentioning with the literature, if you're able to say, here is an example showing how this package works with this literature and here's the test and you put that out there. Everyone can use that and then that can become the resource. So like in the risk assessment, you can say, well, I can see that there are tests here with public data already. I don't need to rewrite my own test, which also said, you know, simplifies the internal execution time because you sort of front load it in your upfront risk assessment rather than have it in as part of your own um, process. So with that, we can get to, um, you know, you can almost imagine like a risk metric, like has tests that are available on some R validation hub resource potentially. But it's, we get, we've got deep into this conversation before. It's very difficult to get, I think, again, to the point I made earlier and you referenced Nick, to get that ball rolling. Um, I mean, once we've got something there, we can look and tweak it and see what, what we can do that's more. Um, and, and if there are volunteers, by the way, on this call, the one thing that the R Validation Hub survives on is people's, effectively people's spare time. So if there are people who are interested in these topics and would be looking to potentially lead any of these initiatives, um, we'd certainly welcome that, that input from anybody on this call. Okay, we've got about four minutes left. There was one more playful question um, which was asked on GitHub, um, which I think is interesting to ask, which is, has anybody rejected a package? I know rejected means different things to different companies, but um, so some companies will say, well, something that is deemed high risk and then you write tests, but you could still, I guess, theoretically get to a point where you write some tests and they fail. <laughs> so does that, has anyone come across anything whether they're not accepting at the end of the day? Um... There's one uh, instance uh, where we had one package that we had qualified and uh, put in uh, moderate risk um, a category, at least at Mark, um, where we had said that this could be used for moderate risk uh, use cases. But um, the issue was that 
that package was not backward compatible with an older version of R that was being used. And so we had to actually reject that package from the moderate uh, use case till we had progressed to a more, um, you know, latest later versions of R. So that's one use, one scenario where we had to reject a package uh, for that purpose. Um, but happy to say in the latest <laughs> round of qualification, it is now back into the moderate uh, use case. So. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I can double down on this one. Uh, and also uh, what Nicolas said, uh, the versioning is very important, like the whole environment that you're running uh, the package on. Because there were some cases uh, when, for example, a package was being upgraded and it was using some other underlying li libraries. And there was some assumption made that could make the package actually crash on the same functionality that was working before. Or actually there was a functionality changed, like the name of the function that hasn't changed, the description hasn't changed, but the uh, behavior for some edge cases would change. And this could uh, uh, make a difference and uh, make uh, the package to be uh, actually not approved. So, so we haven't rejected anything, but we're so early in the process. It's mostly been our core group of experts deciding what packages were going to be allowed for use. So we're not there yet, but I, I fully expect as the ball gets rolling and, and more people begin adopting the use of, of, of SAS and R at the same time, that requests will come up um, that we'll need to, but nothing at this point. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I will. Um... I'll close the meeting out there to at least give you some time to get to your next meetings if you have them. Thank you, everybody. This meeting has uh, been recorded, so we'll release that along with the um, the recording from last time. Thank you again um, to, um, to to Damien and Nick and Co for for presenting um, today, and thanks again for the um, presenters from last time for for coming back and sharing some of your some of your thoughts. We have a next a part three to this on June 14th. Uh, so the, I don't think the invite's gone out yet, but I will send that out afterwards. Um, so if you want to come back and continue this discussion, drill into some of those areas, ask new questions to the new presenters, then um, June 14th, we'll, we'll um, follow up with another one. All right, thank you very much, everybody. And hopefully I'll see you in a month. Thank you. 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 Thank you.